Well, today we are going to be considering the subject that is to do with the sound theology, sound theology. And uh, under this, there are a number of things that uh, I just want us to pay attention on to. And one of the things that I want us to really understand is uh, what do we mean by sound doctrine, the benefits of sound doctrine. And uh, we shall also consider the scripture's emphasis about sound doctrine. We shall also consider the characteristics of uh, false teachers. And then we shall also see how we ought to respond to false teaching. So there are a number of important things like I've already enumerated that we are going to be considering. Sound theology, what is sound doctrine, the benefits of sound doctrine, scripture's emphasis about sound doctrine, the characteristics of our false teachers, and how we ought to respond to false teaching. This is indeed very vital for us also to anchor our souls in the truth, and this is one of the ways for us to sharpen our discernment, because it's very difficult for one to be able to discern when you don't know the truth. For the scripture says that sanctify them by your truth, thy word is the truth, John seventeen seventeen. And Paul actually went ahead to say in Philippians 1, 9, he prayed for the Philippians that their love might abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, with knowledge and all discernment. And what is also very outstandingly very important is the last words Peter the Apostle spoke to the believers that were scattered abroad when he said to them in a Second Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very important for us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these are important things that any Christian that knows nothing about sound theology, sound doctrine, that Christian won't be able to combat falsehood, won't be able to mark and avoid those that he's supposed to mark and avoid. That Christian will actually open himself to all aberrant teachings that contradict the rest of the scriptures. But the moment an individual's faith is anchored in what we call sound theology, that individual will grow well, will grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this indeed takes an outstanding decision of one choosing to be a student of God's word and always investing himself into the word of God so that he comes to a place where he can indeed begin to see his life transforming to the glory of God, him being able to test all things and uh, to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So it is sound doctrine, it is sound theology that does all of that. So not to take much time, I want us to begin on it. When we talk about sound theology, you know, many people fear disciplines that are to do with the word of God because I grew up also here in this common notion of saying, I do not want to be judged. Those that know a lot will be judged. So you find that people actually give up onto the aspect of they investing their lives in the word of God, studying God's word. And uh, they actually go to James chapter 3 and they fail to understand what James was meaning. And of course, you know, James 3, one says, Not men of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So when they look at that text, they begin to say that, you know what, the more you open yourself to learning and all that. But the thing is very clear. The text is very clear. It says, not many of you, not many of you should become teachers. The Bible is not stopping you from studying. Actually, Second Timothy tells us that study to show yourself approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed but one who can correctly and rightly divide the word of truth. So there is no any biblical account that actually instructs you to give up on study the word of God. So what you see is people doing actually in suggestions, they actually impose their mind on the text and uh, they also become creative in the sense that they come to the text and they see in the text what is not in the text. So what is in their mind is what they actually impose onto the text and so they begin to believe in things that are not in step with the writing of the word of God. But we know so very much well, God always commands us. Several scriptures tell us how God commands us to really open ourselves to the studying of his word. Which scripture can you go to that actually won't 
uh, encourage you to do that. When you study Psalms 19, it says that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the way simple. This is what actually the word of God does to us the more we open our souls to it. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You want to have your eyes open? Go to the scriptures. Go to the reading of the scriptures. Sit under a pulpit of a person that is fully devoted and to teaching sound theology expositionally. Uh, it turns in to say that uh, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even as fine gold, sweeter than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. This is what the word of God teaches us. So when it comes to the issue of James, what the text says is, is very plain. The text is discouraging many from actually becoming teachers. Why? Because we are dealing with God's word. And so if, if you know that you're dealing with God's word, you need to devote yourself into study. Many want to run out into teaching, but they are not willing to power themselves into actually the time of studying, the time of actually meditating on the word of God, seriousness in prayer. So it's why that warning is there. And it is very beneficial to us to know that if greater strictness of judgment awaits us as teachers, therefore we should be very careful on how we deal with God's word. We shouldn't just uh, with the word of God. We should properly, correctly, divide God's word. So, I hope that one uh, will help you to put uh, a number of things in their rightful perspective for you not to excuse yourself from studying that which is sound, that which is pure, that which is actually right. So, when you speak of sound theology, we are simply talking about a form of theology, a form of theology that is faithful, that is faithful to the entire Bible. There are different forms of theology, but now this is another form, sound theology, and uh, it is inclusive of what we call sound doctrine. So when we talk about sound theology, it is a form of theology that is faithful to the entire Bible. In other words, this theology actually embraces what we call the unity of the scripture that is old and new testament and that's the thing that still you see in second timothy chapter 3 uh second timothy chapter 3 and a verse is a uh, uh, 16 which says all scripture is breathed out by god and profitable for teaching for reproof for correction and for training in righteousness and so that is the thing that this kind of theology is faithful to the entire bible the Old and the New Testament. And we know that when you talk about the Bible, the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about a person that is known as Christ. That God, for his own glory, is reconciling all things under King Jesus Christ. And so, one to arrive to what we call sound theology is why one needs to do what Second Timothy 2.15 says, that do your best to present yourself to present yourself to God as one, as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So this is to mean that there are many that are ashamed. And the thing that takes away the shame is one presenting himself before God as one approved. But that cannot be a reality without one investing time in studying, in studying. So it says that one has to study and uh, it demands diligence. One has to make an effort to be prompt, has to be actually diligent. He has to endeavor to labor to do the studying. It's very, very important. And then the other thing is that we get to realize that uh, God only approves a minister that is a student of his word. So one is approved after he has been tested that he is indeed an individual that is devoted into study, is devoted in rightly handling the word of truth. The Greek word is actually orthotomeo, orthotomeo, which actually indicates what we call the right dividing. 
basically means one dividing, one actually dissecting, one expounding correctly the divine message. But when he's doing it, he rightly does it. He rightly does it. He doesn't practice what we call paraxosia, where one puts truth next to error, which is something very common today. Men putting the truth next to error. And so they come up large. They speak actually a lot of lies, but it is covered by some amount of truth. So if one is not very diligent in listening, one would basically think that he's receiving something genuine, yet he's not receiving something genuine. So how do we arrive to sound theology? For us to be actually faithful to the entire Bible, we have gotten actually to devote, to be diligent in the studying of the scriptures. Because true preaching is hard work. Preaching is not easy. That's why God doesn't want everyone to be a preacher. He doesn't want everyone to be a preacher because it is hard work. It calls what we call diligence. One actually being devoted. So this thing here, when it comes to the subject of uh, preaching, like I've already made my case that uh, true preaching is hard work. True preaching is indeed hard work. It's why the scripture says in Second Timothy that do your best to present yourself as a workman. And so when you look at that word workman, the Greek is a gut, and a gut basically speaks of a toiler. In other words, actually a laborer. So the aspect of one being a toiler, it basically shows you that uh, true preaching is indeed hard work. It demands actually diligence in one study to present something before God's people that has been properly exegeted, that has gone under proper exegesis. So the ones that are not willing to be toilers, the ones that are not willing to be laborers, they are not welcome. It's why in the very letter uh, that Paul wrote to Timothy, you see that in First Timothy 5.18 it says that, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. That the true reward in ministry, talk about financial support and all other forms of support to a gospel minister. Biblically, all that support is meant to go out to a minister that sees himself as a toiler, as a laborer, as a workman, the one that is actually compared to the ox. Because if the ox has worked the land, why should it be muzzled? In other words, a minister that is diligent in his studies, to study the word of God, to do his good exegesis before he does the exposition, that minister is worthy of double honor, in other words, or is worthy of reward because he has worked for it. Preaching doesn't just come that easily, where one just wakes up and he says, I'm going to do a teaching about this and that. No, it takes time, diligence. It takes actually you laboring, spending time, and feeding on a number of important truths that are in the scripture. And uh, one would again say, but can you keep on throwing in this statement that is to do with uh, sound, sound? What does it mean? Now, when we do talk about what is sound, we are basically talking about something that is reliable, accurate, and faithful. For anything to be sound, it has to be reliable, accurate, and faithful. And you've got to remember that God's word is our ultimate standard. We don't have any other standard. The word of God is our ultimate standard. In other words, anything else beyond the written word isn't our standard and authority. We subject ourselves to what we call the sufficiency of the scripture, meaning the scripture contains all the words God intended for his people to have at each stage of redemptive history and is containing everything we need God to tell us for salvation and trusting in him completely. So that's the thing. The word of God is sufficient, that it contains all the words God intended for his people to have at each stage of redemptive history and is containing everything we need God to tell us for salvation and trusting him perfectly. So when an individual arrives to that place, we can say that that individual is actually 
is sound in its theology. Why is it sound in his theology? Is sound in his theology because his theology is shaped by the word of God. So it is the word of God that is infallible, inherent, authoritative, that is sufficient, that makes our that makes our teaching to be sound. And so that is why I am making that concretization that anything else beyond the written word isn't our standard and authority. Case in point, talk about dreams, talk about visions, talk about goosebumps, talk about small still voices. Those are not our standards. And any of you that has been in church for some good time, you, you've realized that this is the common norm where our modern day ministers that are very much well renowned always actually go to they talk about visions they talk about dreams they talk about small still voices and many other things but you never hear them having their finger onto the text to say that the ultimate standard for us as believers is god's word that is infallible and inherent my dear ones I've said it in other teachings, but it keeps on coming when we talk about some of these particular aspects. That God has fully and finally given us everything to understand his plan of redemption. God is not about to give us, but God has already given us and what he has given unto us is sufficient and it's enough. So ours is to go to him in prayer, to open our minds that we may clearly understand that which is written. And so that is to mean that the canon of the scripture is now closed. No new revelations are we to expect to receive from God. God has given us his word in the 66 books of the Bible. So since God's word is the ultimate standard, therefore our teaching should be sound. So any teaching that is not actually coming out of the scripture, any teaching that is not illustrated scripture after scripture that teaching you cannot trust it why remember what is sound is reliable accurate and faithful so a minister that has sound theology is a minister that sees the reliability the accuracy and the faithfulness of god's word if a minister comes to a place of seeing the reliability, the accuracy, and the faithfulness of God's word, that minister's teaching will be sound, will be sound. The minister himself is not the one that is the standard, but the word of God that he has subjected his mind to makes his teaching sound. Now, the opposite is true. Any minister that has not subjected his mind to God's written word, his teaching cannot be sound because he has other sources. Which other sources are not reliable, they are not accurate, they are not faithful. And again, you have to remember, dear ones, since an emphasis has been made, when we do talk about sound doctrine, we are simply talking about a teaching that rightly explains what God has revealed to us in his word. A sound teaching is limited it is actually exclusively tied to that which is written and it teaches it rightly it doesn't add to it it only rightly explains what god has already revealed it's the thing you see in deuteronomy 4 2 thou shall you not add or subtract from my word it's the same it, it is the thing that you see in deuteronomy 12 32 thou shall you not add or subtract from my word it's the thing you see in proverbs 30 verses 5 to 6 thou shall you not add or subtract from my word list i rebuke you it is a thing you see in first corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 which says that that we should not exalt any man above that which is written it is a thing you see in revelation 20 22 18 to 19 that no one should add or subtract from that which is already given it is a thing that you see in jude 1 3 that we should contend for the faith that was given once it is the same thing you also see in the book of actually hebrews 1 2 to 3 that god has spoken unto us in these last days by his son jesus christ where do we find the words of our lord in the written word it is the same thing you see in second peter 3 2 peter saying that i want you guys to be mindful of the thing that was spoken to you by the holy prophets of the lord and the apostles of the lord it is the same thing that you see in jude 1 17 that we should be mindful of the words of the apostles 
So, sound doctrine is a teaching that rightly explains what God has already revealed. But you see, you will often hear men and women running out saying that they are sound preachers. Now, remember that is just something like a bite on a hook for them. It's like a bite on a hook for them to catch the gullible ones. So, they will use some theological words just to borrow the value of those theological words for them to keep their relevance. For them to keep their relevance, but they don't mean what they are saying. Because we are saying that for a teaching to be sound, it has to be a teaching that rightly explains what God has revealed to us in his word. It's not about to reveal, but what God has already revealed. And there is actually an outstanding benefit to us sitting under pulpits where sound doctrine is being dispensed. Number one, sound doctrine is essential to the church and the Christian life because it is a central means by which we grow to maturity in Christ. This is to indicate that if a person does not actually sit under sound doctrine, that individual's Christian life won't grow to maturity in Christ. It's the thing that you see actually in a Hebrews 5 that the writer said a number of things here that are very important for us to consider. That for though by this time you ought, Hebrews 5 to love, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, and he is a child. But solid food, he says in 14, is for the mature, for those who have by their powers of discernment trained by the powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So, the church and the life of the Christians will never grow to maturity unless ministers go back unto believing the sufficiency of the scripture, which scriptures are actually infallible, inher inherent, authoritative. Therefore, with devotion and diligence to that which has already been given, as they study, we can be very sure that those men will come out of their study with something to deliver to the flock. So God, in other words, we can say that he has chosen that sound doctrine should be the central means by which the church and the Christians grow into maturity. Because it is him that ordains the means and the ends. So the means that has chosen to grow his church is none other than the true preaching that is faithful to that which is given. No wonder First Peter chapter 2 says what it says in verses 2, First Peter 2, the verses 2, like newborn infants, long for the pure, long for the pure. They're not talking about something else, they're talking about sound doctrine, for the pure spiritual milk but it you may grow up into salvation. It is what Peter is talking about. He's not talking about something else. And so you see the Christian and the entire local church will grow in life and liveliness as they organize their lives around God's word. There is no any other way. These new fads that people have gone into, uh, the lights, the entertainment, the skits, the storytelling, the progressive uh, gospel, the social gospel, the narrative theology, all those things cannot actually grow the lives of the believers. So when the church listens and follows God's word, that is faithfully proclaimed, hallowed, that church will begin to look like the one it is following. Many churches today that we do see, they indeed look like they are hipster, actually, pastors. Because the pastor himself is, a, is an individual that is open to pragmatism and all new forms that uh, many people are running after to see that they make it to see that they win numbers before sound doctrine. You find that everyone in the church is not different, actually, from the pastor. But the reality is, Paul made it very clear in 1 Corinthians 11, that be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In other words, the apostle do not have told us to imitate him if he wasn't imitating Christ. 
That is also to explain to us that the apostle is saying he would not be a worthy candidate to be imitated if he ceased imitating Christ. The same is true today. Don't follow a minister that does not see the sufficiency of the scriptures. A minister that has gotten his eyes away from Christ because you cannot separate Christ from his written word. He says his words are spirit and life. The apostle said that where shall we go? Where shall we go? For it is you that has words of eternal life. So any minister that does not see life in the word of Christ and then they go out for all those things that are to do with marketing psychology. That is a minister that you should not put yourself under because he's leading you nowhere. Why? Because like the hymn writer wrote in a hymn that is known as Show Us Christ. The hymn writer says that prepare our hearts, O God. Help us to receive. Break the hard and stony ground. Help our unbelief. Plant your word down deep in us. Cause it to bear fruit. Open up our ears to hear. Lead us in your truth. And then the refrain says, show us Christ. Show us Christ. O oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord. These are powerful words, all drawn from the text, all drawn from the text, because it is through God's written word that we are going to be able to bear fruit that actually will also come to the truth. The hymn writer adds in to send a second line, Your word is living light. Upon our darkened eyes, guides us through temptations, makes the simple wise. Your word is food for famished ones, freedom for the slave, riches for the needy soul. Come speak to us today. And then they end by saying, where else can we go? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Such songs, you cannot hear them today in many mainstream churches. Because that's not their language. They are separated from the language of the scriptures. But you can also tell that a hymn writer who wrote that hymn, you have to understand that whether it's a man or a woman, one thing you can just be sure about, he had what we call sound theology. He had what we call sound theology. Dear ones that are listening, the church that is built on God's sufficient word reflects Christ is love and holiness. Because still it is the word that will help us to be able to discern, to escape the temptations, knowing the things that are not acceptable before God. So are we following Christ or we are following man? If we are following Christ, therefore we should go back to his word. And it is his word that displays his glory. Through the preaching of his word, his glory is actually made known to his people. And uh, the Church of Christ does not look to the best business practices. All the latest styles, however, looks to God. And this starts by simply listening to faithful preaching of his sufficient word. Man, some of you, I know in the near future, you will begin to say that I am parroting a lot. But be as it may, I would basically say that if we still see what is happening in many of our churches here in Uganda, it's okay, I'll continue to parrot the same truth. Because imagine, the true church of God, it shouldn't look to the best business practices. It shouldn't look to the latest styles. It should look to God. And how is it going to look to God? That simply starts by the church listening, the believers, the saints listening to faithful preaching of the sufficient word of God. That's how actually the church look like the one it is following. And uh, I know time has gone. And uh, at this point, I just want to share with you uh, the scripture's emphasis about sound doctrine. For you to understand why am I emphasizing this thing a lot. When Paul was writing to Titus, he said to him in, in Titus 2, Titus 2, now verses 1, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. This is the scriptural emphasis that a true minister should teach what accords with sound doctrine. 
I also want to show you from Titus 1, the verses 9. It says that he must hold firm to the trustworthy word. Another version says to the faithful word. As taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. A true minister, like we have already seen, his job is simply to rightly explain what God has already revealed to us in his word faithfully. It's what you see in Titus 1.9. And again, one other place that you can also consider is actually 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, the verse is actually 8 to 11. It says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Sound doctrine is the way to go. Many other scriptures also make an emphasis about the importance of sound doctrine as far as the New Testament appeal, that we ought to be sound. We ought to be sound. It's the same thing you see in First Timothy 1. Uh, three. It says, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia to remain, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. The doctrine has already been given. Ours is to guard that which has already been given. Ours is to rightly explain that which God has already given. Now, in a few minutes I am now left with, I also want to talk about the characteristics of false teachers. One of it is what we have just considered here in uh, 1 Timothy 1.3. False teachers do contradict the apostolic teaching. They do contradict the apostolic teaching. It's why Timothy is being told to remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So if you hear people not believing in the sufficiency of the scripture, seeking for visions, dreams, I a new revelation, fresh revelation, small still voices, just know something is wrong. That is an individual in a state that is very dangerous. So what they are very much well known for is that they contradict the apostolic teaching. They do not see the sufficiency of the scripture, that the writings of the, of the apostles were the final writings of God to man. The other thing is uh, that is a characteristic of uh, false teachers is that false teaching contradicts the words of Christ. They contradict not only the words of the apostles, but they also contradict the words of Christ. When you consider First Timothy chapter 6, the verse 3, it says, Teach and urge you these things. If anyone teaches, teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and a teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with consight and understands nothing. So, that's the second trait. They contradict the teachings of the apostles, 1 Timothy 1, 3, but they also go ahead to contradict the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 6, 3. Third, false teaching is also characterized by refusal to submit to God. It is also characterized by refusal to submit to God. Titus 1, 10, it says, For there are many who are insubordinate, that even when you talk to them, they are insubordinate. So, there is that thing that they don't accept where they are wrong. They don't accept they are wrong. They are insubordinate. That even when you show the truth to them in love, they are men that are insubordinate. Fourth, false teaching is also characterized by empty talks and deception. Still, the verse makes it very clear in Titus 1.10. They are deceivers, they are empty talkers, and they are deceivers. So, they promise a lot that they cannot deliver. How many today we hear of that say, all Christians all have healing ministry. So, they themselves see no healings, and the folks in their congregations also see no healing. But they are empty talkers and deceivers. 
However, they deceive the gullible ones. So, this is it, dear ones. But now, what should be our response in conclusion of all that we have considered after knowing the need for sound doctrine and us having seen the emphasis of the scripture about sound doctrine and us having also seen the characteristics of false teachers? Now, what should be our response? What should we do about false teaching? My dear ones, the Bible commands us to expose it and rebuke those who teach it. The Bible commands us to expose it, to expose it, and rebuke those who teach it. The scriptures are very clear, even when you do just consider uh, the ones that we have already considered, like Titus 1.9, it is on the point when it says that uh, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict. That is our responsibility. We shouldn't put up with actually false teachings. The same thing that you also see in Romans chapter 16, the verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. This is all our response from the scripture. Mark and avoid. Why should you mark and avoid? For such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flatterly, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So, there's another one that is also made very clear to us from Ephesians, which I also need us to consider. Ephesians 5, the verse is uh, 11. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Expose them. So now, when we come out and we expose the lies that people are saying that we have a critical spirit, that we are unloving and all that, the thing is this, dear ones, we cannot sacrifice the truth at the altar of compromise because we, seek, because we are seeking for people to love or to like us. Our loyalty goes to God first. Our allegiance goes to God first. And uh, it's why you see that, again, Timothy was told to hold people accountable to teach true doctrine. So it is our responsibility. And so, my dear ones, sound doctrine is a central means by which Christians grow in holiness. And holiness is the goal of sound doctrine. If a person sits under sound doctrine, the end product is that person growing, not only that person becoming mature in the knowledge of Christ, but that person will also grow in holiness. Why in holiness? Because it is holiness that is the goal of sound doctrine. That's what we see actually Paul writing to the believers, considering First Thessalonians chapter 4 and the verse is uh, 1 to 3. It says, finally, finally then, brothers, even as I also make a final word, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So this is it. Sanctification is a big part of a true Christian. First of all, we know that there is what we call positional sanctification, which has taken place already that we have been saved from the penalty of sin, but now we are still living under what we call the power of sin. It's why we need to continue to live separated lives to the glory of God. But one thing that facilitates that is what we call sound doctrine. As we wait for the time when we shall be saved from the presence of sin, uh, which actually the Bible calls glorification. But for now, we have this long process of actually progressive sanctification taking place as we continue to immerse and sit under the true teaching of the word of God. I pray that the good Lord will use this teaching to I open many of you to realize the importance of sound theology in the local gatherings. That if you're a Christian that has received this teaching, you shouldn't put up with a minister that is not willing to be diligent to study to teach you the truth. And any place where you belong, where there is no actually this fruit of holiness, uh, where you do not see actually lives being transformed by people living the sin that they loved so much in the past, 
to they continually striving to conform to the person of Christ, there is also a danger there. So, I don't want to go beyond this point. I pray that the good Lord continues to work his work of grace in your hearts, to love his word, and always to stand for that which is true. Shalom.